discussion that we will, we will be uh, uh, discussing um, several uh, themes in, in terms of public health, uh, related to public health. Sometimes we are not uh, talked um, in the general media or in, in the general uh, population. And then at the end, uh, we will have a question and answer that is questions from you all. The chat uh, will be open uh, shortly. Uh, you can put your uh, uh, questions there. Um, but in the interest of time, you know, Dr. Sapkota, Dr. Amir Sapkota will compile your questions and we'll have that um, at the third phase. Okay, let's get started and jump into right into our program. This is a one hour, 30 minute program. Uh, COVID-19 is a pandemic, uh, meaning this new infection or disease, um, emphasizing, I'm emphasizing new, uh, is occurring globally and not as outbreaks in certain regions. So we have to treat it as, you know, it's occurring everywhere. This virus does not discriminate and does not recognize borders. And by now we all know about that. However, it, is, it still needs to be understood at a local and regional level to implement prevention and treatment strategies considering local issues. The goal of this Zoominar session is to help provide the scientific knowledge of COVID-19 from a public health perspective as of today, July 25th, 2021. I emphasize the date because it is an evolving pandemic. General public globally have some opinions, especially in social media, that science is not being truth in this pandemic since new data are telling us how the pandemic is shaping. I think everyone should be very mindful that science is the art of finding the truth. When science changes its opinion, in this case, it is based on new data and that are emerging globally. It is not lying to you. It is learning more and it is the duty of academicians to tell the truth as we learn. Thus, the panel that we have will be discussing the state of COVID-19 in the context of Nepal as we know today. So without taking too much of your time, um, let me get right into it and um, introduce our first panelist, Dr. Madhav Bhatta. Dr. Madhav Bhatta was trained as an infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he obtained his PhD degree. Dr. Bhatta is a professor of epidemiology and global health at Kent State University in the United States. He also serves as the senior public health advisor for Back to Life, a Germany-based NGO working on health and development issues in rural Nepal. He has been following the COVID-19 pandemics in Nepal closely and has, multiple, uh, and has published multiple articles in the newspapers in Nepal. Um, and he's been sharing his insights. So it is uh, very timely that he will be sharing his insights and his experience and observations in the panel today. On a personal level, um, Dr. Bhatta grew up in Baitadi, so he does represent West Nepal. Dr. Bhatta, floor is yours. Dr. Madhav? Hang on. All right, thank you. I was having trouble with unmuting myself. Well, thank you, Dr. Sadeep Shrestha. It's my pleasure to be here, part of this distinguished panel of guests from Nepal, uh, colleagues from Nepal, as well as the United States to talk about the state of the pandemic globally, as well as in Nepal. Before I move on to my presentation, I'm, gonna, I'm going to disclose or uh, talk about my any conflict of interest. I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose related to COVID-19, but in the past I have received uh, a, a grant subcontract from a local mental health agencies that was funded by uh, Janssen Scientific Affairs, which is a subsidiary of uh, Johnson. Johnson and Johnson and Johnson actually has a COVID-19 vac vaccine that uh, there's no direct conflict of interest regardless. But again, thank you NACA for allowing me to uh, uh, talk about uh, be a panelist here. And again, I'm honored to be you know, on, on panel with colleagues from Nepal 
who will share on the ground uh, situation in Nepal. So my talk is gonna be more of a global situation, uh, COVID-19 situation that will provide some background information while we discuss COVID-19 in Nepal, as well as hopefully it will spur some questions and uh, commentary later in the discussion section. As Dr. Sadiq Shrestha just said, COVID-19 uh, is a global pandemic that's impacting uh, the entire world. And it is a global pandemic because it is caused by a new virus, as he rightly pointed out, which has a zoonotic origin. That means it started in animals, then jumped into human beings and most likely candidate, it's a bats. And although there are some speculation about other theories on the origin of SARS coronavirus 2, the, the causative agent, the preponderance of scientific evidence today suggests it is a zoonotic disease. And because it's a new disease, everybody in the world, 7.4 billion people are susceptible to it. And it's a highly transmissible disease. It's an airborne transmission. Uh, because it's, it's an or airborne transmission. And in the beginning of the pandemic, there was some, you know, not enough data to see whether it was just a droplet transmission versus air, airborne transmission. And that actually led to some issues related to mask, um, recommending masks, especially in the United States. And the country is still suffering from the, <laughs> the fallout from the, some of the, the confusion or lack of data. Uh, and it is a pathogenic organism. That means it does cause disease, clinical disease. It causes, it's highly infectious, it transmits, but it also causes pathogen. It's pathogenic, it's a clinical disease, and it's virulent in terms of the severity of disease it causes. And to the point it's, it's fatal, uh, anywhere between a half a percent, 0. 0.5 to 2% of people who are infected end up dying. And that may not seem like a lot of, you know, high percentage proportion of, of people, but imagine if all 7.4 billion people in the world got infected, that could potentially kill 35 to 70 million people. So uh, it, it is a global pandemic because, you know, for the last one year, I've, you know, there've been a lot of misinformation about, yeah, it's not a bad enough disease. So right now we're defining COVID based on the, the viral pre presence of virus in the body using a molecular test, either looking for the genetic material or antigen test looking at uh, looking for the protein, uh, protein of the virus in the body. And that's how we're defining somebody has the virus or not. And there are other types of tests called antibody tests, which actually looks at the history of uh, somebody having the infection in the past, but that doesn't tell you if they're currently infected. It's the diagnostic test, either molecular or antigen test that are gonna be to, uh, indicating whether you have a current infection or not. So that's how we are defining COVID, uh, you know, positive. If you're positive, then you have COVID, but the, the, the infection and the disease have a, a long manifestation, a, a different manifestation from asymptomatic cases to mild cases to uh, are really severe cases where it requires hospitalizations and eventually in some uh, half a percent or two or three percent people likely are dying. So, you know, we have to really think about in terms of the impact it is going to have both in terms of the public health impact as well as the clinical and health service impact, understand what is the breakdown of the clinical cases versus asymptomatic cases or severe cases because you know, when asymptomatic cases are also transmitting the disease, uh, the, the virus, then from a public health perspective, that is really uh, important to know and what percentage of people are doing that. From a clinical health service prov provision perspective, we want to know how many people are going to be severely infected and then potentially for, uh, medical treatment as well as the hospital. So it is an evolving pandemic, as Dr. Sreshta just alluded, both in terms of the virus is evolving and the virus that started in China infected Europe, North America is different uh, than the virus that is now, the, 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 the Delta variant that is not uh, predominant in most of the world, the Delta variant that is started in India and now is actually the predominant. And what 
you know, the virus mutates because every time virus replicates, it potentially makes uh, errors or changes in its uh, genetic component. And if those changes are uh, sufficient enough, it gives it more competitive advantage in terms of the transm transmissibility or pathogenicity, then that is going to be going to take the the overtake the, the existing uh, existing strains. And that is important to know both from a epidemiologic perspective, because if it's more transmissible, then more people are getting gonna get infected. Even though it may not be pathogenic, uh, it may change in the pathogenicity, but if it's more people are uh, readily getting infected, then yeah then you're gonna have more people who are gonna get sick regardless of whether the, the, the pathogen is city or virulence of the virus changes or not. And you know, if you look at the, how the, 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 the epidemic has evolved both in terms of the time and geography, it started in China, went to Europe, then into the United States and North America. And, and South Africa, South America. And, and at different time, point in time, different countries are going through different waves. Now the United States is going to, through a, a potentially fourth wave versus Nepal is essentially waiting for a third wave. And, and if you look at the global distribution of cases and death, it has substantially changed. And it's not only a, just a function of virus, it's also a function of the, the interventions as well as the mitigation measures and now the vaccine that is, uh, that has come, up, come, come, come in line. So the pandemic has had impact globally, every country, every society, both in terms of health, economic and, and social impact. And just purely looking from the, the health impact, one of the, the the way we can look at it is one of the, I, I put it in quotes as an easiest measure that you can look at is the mortality associated. I say it's easy because, you know, it's not hard to, you know, measure whether somebody's dead or alive. It's just, <laughs> but well, the problem lies, you know, is there a system where the, the those deaths are accurately recorded or not? But so if you look at one of the in, in indicators of the pandemic, you know, just looking at right now, the Europe, North America, and South America are actually the most impacted country on our per capita basis. United States, on you know, based on the official figure, has the highest number of deaths. But I say that official because whether you know the India and South Asia and Nepal, we, it's not as impacted as some other part of the world. Is it really that's the case, or is it a function of not having the accurate data? accurate and valid data. So when we are assessing impact as well as comparing different populations in terms of the impact of the disease, we have to be careful about what is the, the, the state of the data collection and the information that is being collected. And the two examples I can give is if you look at India, it has officially on 400,000 deaths, but there's a new study that, that came three about a week ago, that suggests the actual deaths may be in millions, one to four million, depending on you know what uh, matrix that you use. They are looking at what you call excess deaths. That means more than what you would normally expect. And uh, using three methods, they are coming up with a widely higher estimates. And in Peru, in the last few weeks, they actually changed their estimate. Well, we have of, one minute. All right, thank you. Uh, estimate from uh, the, their mortality rate has actually upgraded to 200,000. Uh, and again, based on the excess death. So we do have several vaccines now available and, and the vaccines are actually gonna be the long-term solution. The question with vaccines and uh, we'll in the discussion section, we'll talk about different types of vaccines available if somebody have a questions on, but we actually have a seven vaccines that actually have the WHO has uh, approved for emergency use authorizations. And the question, the, the issue, biggest issue right now with the vaccine is the availability of vaccine. Everybody wants the vaccine, but there are not enough vaccines in the world. And in most part of the world, avail availability is the issue. But in some parts of the world, it's not actually vaccine hesitancy, unfortunately. And that's the dichotomy you have in the world. 
you know, we're uh, in some parts of the world, vaccine availability is a major issue in other parts of the world. You know, there are enough vaccines, but not enough people taking the vaccines. So with that sort of a broad introduction, I'm going to stop uh, right now, but I'll we will listen to the other, uh, other uh, two other distinguished panelists from Nepal, and we'll circle back and you know, look at, into the details of some of the issues that are going to be raised. And I'm going to provide some links to some of the, the, the writings that I've done in the last few weeks. And this presentation will be available with the different references that I have used in this talk. Thank you, Dr. Shrestha, and I move it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Madhav. You know, if you can um, take your screen out and um, if doc Dr. Archana can upload her slides. So from the global perspective, you know, defining, you know, some of the key words and key concepts of the pandemic as a whole, we'll move to uh, Dr. Archana Sesta, um, disclosure, we're not related. Uh, Dr. Archana Sesta is also trained in epidemiology and she obtained her uh, PhD from University of Washington. She's currently an associate professor in the Department of Public Health at Kathmandu University School of Medical Sciences in Delhi Hill. Uh, she's also the Nepal director at the Institute for Implementation Science and Health in Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, she also holds an adjunct professor um, in the Department of Chronic Diseases Epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health. Um, lately, for those of you in Nepal, you know, you are probably familiar um, seeing her um, on TV and whatnot. Um, she has been heavily uh, been involved in COVID-19, uh, leading her own team at Kathmandu University, but also advising and consulting the government and Ministry of Health at various levels. Uh, just to give some examples, she's a data advisor for the epidemiology and disease control division. Um, for COVID-19 response on Corona Crisis Management Center. Uh, she's the data audit lead investigator for Nepal Health Research Council. Um, she will be providing some insights um, as a whole in Nepal and also some of her uh, and her team's work at Kathmandu University in um, two provinces. Uh, Dr. Arjuna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sadip. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, sorry, my introduction. Um, so I will be talking about COVID-19 preparedness and response in Nepal uh, over the past one and a half years. Uh, let me just quickly start with uh, with our uh, with a quick disclosure that I have nothing to disclose and no any conflict of interest. Uh, during uh, for this presentation. So uh, let's start with a uh, quick evolution of uh, and development of COVID-19 and its response in Nepal. We had our first reported case on the 23rd of uh, January, 2020. And uh, uh, second case after two months after that on 3rd, 23rd March, 2020. In between that, uh, Nepal uh, Airlines aircraft airlifted about 175 Nepal 75 Nepalese students from Wuhan, where they, there was a big epidemic of COVID and um, then they quarantined in Kathmandu. Um, soon after the, uh, at the time of second uh, case, Nepal government also uh, did all international borders were sealed. And um, soon after that, the next day, a uh, nationwide lockdown was imposed. It was a very, very strict lockdown. Despite that, we saw our first local transmission on 4th of April in Koilali district and our first death uh, on 14th May. It was uh, fortunately, unfortunately, it happened in Dulikil Hospital and I was the one who did the case investigation for that. I was one of the team members. Um, and uh, and then we have had some pause. Uh, we, have, we saw a very low case loads and uh, less incidents. Um, but after, uh, soon after that, uh, we started seeing uh, increase in cases in Nepal. Uh, as a result, Nepal government uh, announced a lockdown. Uh, uh, again, so, sorry, the, the lockdown ended in 7th of July and we saw our first wave. 
and vaccination started on 27th of January. Uh, soon after that, we started seeing another surge of uh, COVID-19, and our second lockdown started. Um, it started in Kathmandu, started with the Kathmandu Valley, but soon it uh, extended to the whole nation, and we saw our seven, second wave uh, in spite of the strict lockdown. And uh, after the cases started to go down, uh, we uh, saw the loosening up of the lockdown uh, in June of 2021. Uh, this is a quick overview of uh, uh, case COVID case trend in Nepal, and I'm showing it in comparison to India because um, a lot of us are very aware of what happened in India, and it has it was widely covered by international media as well. And I just wanted to highlight here that we had worse e epidemic in India, uh, in Nepal compared to India, both in the first wave as well as second wave. Our uh, new cases per day per million population was higher in Nepal at the peak uh, compared to India at the peak. Similarly, our uh, death was also uh, higher in Nepal compared to India. We can see blue curve uh, showing India and red curve uh, is showing Nepal. And at the peak, Nepal had ac ac actually uh, more than twice uh, the death rate compared to India. So we saw a much, much worse epidemic in India, in Nepal compared to India. Uh, before the second uh, lockdown, we also had a lot of things happening in Nepal after the cases went down uh, in the first wave. We saw political rallies. Uh, we uh, did not stop celebrating our wedding parties. We even uh, enjoyed Machindra Natchatra. Um, and soon after all of these, uh, uh, like breakages of social distancing policies and regulations, we started to seeing rise in cases and it, rose, it increased really rapidly. Within a uh, few, few weeks, we reached to peak at this time. And then it is uh, uh, slowing down, but it, it is stuck over here. We have, we are not seeing uh, the expected uh, decrease uh, in, the, in our epidemic wave as uh, we would see in the natural curve. It might be because uh, we saw our peak uh, during the lockdown and, uh, and now the lockdown has been loosened up. Uh, so uh, people are mingling and uh, mingling more and there has been a more uh, breakage of uh, social distancing policy, not much uh, compliance in uh, masking. That is why, uh, uh, we the number of cases is not decreasing down and in the recent future it is um, hope it is expected or predicted to be uh, increased a little bit Pro this is the province-wise vaccination status. Overall, uh, Nepal government showed a really high commitment in vaccination uh, to provide vaccination to all population in Nepal. However, uh, it was not um, able to deliver uh, in practice. We have we faced a lot of obstacles in between uh, relating to access to vaccine. Uh, we could not even get the ones that the government uh, actually purchased. So uh, the vaccination rollout has been a little bit uh, slow. And the overall vaccine uh, coverage in Nepal is 4.5% uh, of the population and most of them are uh, health workers because health workers were placed at the first priority. If we look at the distribution of vaccine coverage by province, we saw we see that there is a big disparity there as well. Uh, for example, Bagmati province has 11% uh, coverage and province two has only about 1% coverage. Uh, this uh, graph is showing uh, total number of reported cases per 100,000 population from, uh, from the start to uh, uh, July 23rd. And the darker red means more uh, cases per population was reported. So we see that the central Nepal had much more uh, cases per population, uh, per 1,000 population were reported. Uh, and in West, uh, especially Baki and Surkit were affected and in the East. Morang and Sunzari were more affected. So this may not represent the real uh, case scenario in Nepal because it is uh, only uh, showing the number of, uh, based on the number of reported cases, which is again determined by how much testing was happening where. Um, so uh, this, uh, gra this table quickly gives us a scenario of testing and we can clearly see that uh, there was also a big disparity in how uh, in the number of tests uh, that were happening uh, for, uh, with respect to the population in the province. Uh, clearly, Bagmati province 
had uh, much more testing that was happening compared to other provinces and province two was doing much worse. Uh, meanwhile, uh, all of these testing centers were actually centered in urban areas and there was not much access to testing in rural areas. And this gives uh, a, a glimpse of an example of what's what is really happening. So this was a press release from, uh, um, from uh, Gondagi province um, about a village in Barpak, a specific area in Barpak village where they observe a lot of people reporting symptoms, uh, COVID-like symptoms. And in merely one week, 10 deaths were reported in that uh, specific area. And then they sent uh, teams to investigate that and found that there were uh, there was an epidemic in that area, and uh, initially they could not detect it uh, on time or like before uh, these dates were happening or before there was havoc uh, created because uh, clearly there was not uh, access to treat, uh, testing in this part of uh, in this part of Nepal. It was basically affected by two things. One uh, was the testing centers were located in the urban areas. And second, because of the lockdown, people in rural areas could not uh, go to these centers even if they had symptoms um, or even they suspected themselves of having COVID-19. Uh, and then that is why our local media also did a lot of coverage um, later uh, because um, because these numbers were clearly clearly not reflected in national reports. And we could only uh, imagine or expect the extent of epidemic in the rural areas through these different uh, anecdotes from newspapers. Similarly- So now we have two learning. minutes. Oh. Okay, so uh, we also had the uh, same issues with the treatment. Uh, treatment uh, coverage was also, there was also a lot of disparity in the treatment coverage. And uh, uh, Nepal government had this uh, uh, response network where uh, federal government, provincial government, local government, universities, non-government organizations were working in their own, area, own areas and expertise. They were all help, trying to help, but uh, clearly we could uh, not, see a really coherence, coherent or integrated uh, COVID response uh, within the nation. Uh, meanwhile, KUSMS did uh, some work. Uh, we started uh, surveillance systems for uh, COVID sim symptoms monitoring. We also uh, partnered with ADCD uh, and COVID Corona Crisis Management Centers uh, in epidemiological uh, analysis. We also uh, conducted master's training of training for uh, case investigation and contact tracing. Uh, we uh, helped in, uh, National Health Education and uh, Information Communication Center on epidemiological updates. Uh, we also helped to build uh, capacity for lab strengthening. Uh, we also did uh, uh, specifically partner with Karnali province for case investigation and contact tracing. Uh, similarly, we also supported uh, medical equipments through our different partners, um, uh, we, uh, like such as Direct Relief and uh, AIDS Foundation. Uh, Dulkel Hospital offered 126 um, SDU and 100 ICU and provided COVID care. Um, uh, regarding the variants, uh, Nepal Nepal government announced that we are we have two variants circulating in Nepal. One is Alpha and Delta, and Alpha Delta variant has been a specific variant of concern because uh, most of us are vaccinated. Those who are vaccinated have been vaccinated by AstraZeneca and. Um, it has been uh, said to be about 60% effective against Delta, Delta variant. So Nepal government has placed much more emphasis on these two kinds of variant in Nepal. And that has been the most challenging part uh, in the years to come. Oh, in the interest of time, I'm just uh, going to my last slide, uh, just summarizing the lessons that I personally learned during this uh, time. Uh, the first thing that we uh, really realized that this is a special situation. This is not normal at all. And what was the most important uh, for us was to get out of our comfort zone and really extend uh, extend ourselves to um, help, help and support and participate in responding to COVID-19. And um, everybody is overwhelmed. Uh, like 
be it a person, be it an organization, be it a government or non-government organization, hospitals, a small health center, everybody is overwhelmed. So we really need to be uh, uh, considerate of that while we are uh, doing any COVID or non-COVID related work. Communication regularly with the different partners was very important and that's how we were able to secure, uh, secure funding and other support uh, for our COVID work. Uh, we, were all, we also uh, worked a lot with different bilateral organization, government organization and non-government organization. And that definitely um, caused synergy to our, uh, to our efforts. Uh, what I learned most was the perseverance during this time. We really, um, we need to, we really, when we believe in something, it really helped when we uh, were committed to that and just uh, like, kept going that uh, we will and then uh, we also saw a lot of failure failure is inevitable and uh, that's how we accept it and that's how we kept uh, moving and finally the biggest biggest challenge that and the strength that i saw in in, in nepal in covid response was the novice this uh, decentralized structure we have um, so federal uh, government provincial government and local government will were working uh, tirelessly uh, but on their own and there was uh, there was some disconnect between these uh, in terms of chain of command as well as how uh, the constitution really authorized them to act uh, also in the in this kind of pandemic situation but at the same time uh, there was also a big strength uh, in terms of how quickly uh, local governance uh, and how quickly the province government could act at the local level in order to like, for example, managing the migrant workers that were coming into Nepal and uh, mm -hmm. expanding the testing uh, when there was no testing services available at all in Nepal and even expanding the treatment when there was, a, when we saw a big uh, insurge of COVID-19. So I'll stop here and uh, and we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Dr. Arjuna. Um, you touched on a lot of subjects and we'll be talking about that in our, in our discussion later on. So from Kathmandu, we'll um, go to East Nepal. Um, and um, our panelist there is Dr. Paras Pokhrel. Dr. Paras Pokhrel has a medical uh, degree, MD. Um, in general physician and community medicine. Um, he's currently professor and chief, chief for the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at BP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences. He has served in many academic, provincial, and federal ministry committees. Um, he also serves as a member of academic committee in India, uh, Indian Institute of Public Health, uh, Public Health Foundation of India in New Delhi. He has also worked as a um, regional technical advisor for the WHO. Uh, with his wealth of over two um, decades of experience in public health, uh, he will be talking about the state of COVID in province one and some of the great work uh, that he and his institute has been leading. Um, Dr. Pokhrel, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Somehow your, your slide is not showing up properly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paras, you there? Okay, um, I'm not sure what has happened, um, maybe technical issues. So once he uh, joins back, we'll uh, get him on. Um, maybe we can just start um, discussing a few things. Oh, maybe he's there, all right. Dr. Paris, go ahead. I think you are muted, Dr. Paris. Go ahead and unmute yourself first. Okay. Okay, so we'll start here. Uh, namaskar to everybody. Uh, Dr. Paris, could you make that uh, slide show? Yeah. Yeah. This 
okay for everybody can am i audible to everybody yeah you're good yes yeah yeah so namaskar we'll start that uh, as uh, already discussed and uh, thank you for your kind introduction so i just for the keeping in mind in our time i am talking about province number 1 and in province number 1 we have uh, almost uh, 1 2 3 4 5 6, many many centers uh, who is working for covid 19 management at the moment half government sector and half private so mostly medical college and zonal hospital this is just i'm focusing what bp care as we are doing that is uh, just i'm copying what uh, the every day report is available in uh, our uh, institution web page so this is nothing new to you but uh, just to show that what institute is doing uh, basically what we are talking is uh, uh, the vaccination status i will not talk more we can discuss later but so far uh, we have just a 3% coverage where dr archana also mentioned how much even within the country differences between one province to other province we were talking that uh, you know the one of the good thing in this country and i just uh, noted there is a study from nature that which country has highest number of people looking forward to take the vaccines and nepal stands first so this is what uh, nepali people are looking for for uh, there is a no vaccine hesitancy so far the only availability matters everybody is willing to have the vaccines maximum people are looking towards vaccines but the uh, ss is the problem uh, that goes to province number 1 as well sorry now uh, what public health measures we are doing at uh, province number 1 if someone is a very familiar with the health system in nepal we have the ministry of health in provincial level which looks after two disciplines one is education and other is health called samajik vikas mantri so they decides what to do in a provincial level so now they what they do is uh, they are providing education materials where we have uh, some say on it they do the travel restrictions uh, today only the, one of the town in damak is completely uh, closed and they do the quarantine management case investigation contract tracing and community level screening and testing so what they do means what they did in the first way which may not be in the second way remember one thing i always say that uh, what arjuna presented is something very interesting the anatomy of health system in nepal is a beautiful what doesn't work is a physiology the most of the time our uh, documents are well laid down through many sources and we copy we we are dragged by the consultant but what doesn't work in a grassroots level is that similarly it doesn't decentralize decentralized means most of the time is a delegation of work not not authority so it, sometimes it doesn't work uh, what they are doing in a they did in the uh, province number 1 in web 1 is a very aggressive testing approach uh, the bp kerala institute of health sciences was the first outside kathmandu valley having pcr test and that to be also not from the government sector we got any support we have fortunately our own uh kalaza research program where the pcr was already available in the institute and molecular lab was there so we could do the test after the government gave granted the person permission to us so we were the first people to do test outside kathmandu valley and then we took lead in the province number 1 to help to the viratnagar and other places also to start the pcr test uh, for the human resources and they are uh, opted from the minister of health equipment now uh, the second wave we lost the reason is uh, we got confused we were in a full belief that we are almost controlling the situations no our expert has any clue that how the second wave will go the this happens in the beginning even in the first waves because people compared with the sars 
which did not travel through Nepal, though there was a good connection between Hong Kong and Pohara, Hong Kong and Dhara. We were expecting in 2002, the SARS will reach Nepal, but it never reached, not a single case has been diagnosed. So this time we thought similarly in the first wave as well. And once there was a case, we got panic without preparations. And the second time, second wave was not expected because the Indian case scenario was also a bottom, you know, 30,000, even up to 17,000 in Indian scenario. So we also were very happy. And in the meantime, when the second wave started, number of infected people went up. The saddest part or the tragic part was death increased 163, 63%, one of the highest in the world. And that was still we are not sure whether it is death due to uh, the nature of the virus itself where the oxygen management was the most difficult or we have the facility which are unable to manage the cases so it has to be uh, we have to look up after the at least uh, some sorts of analysis we have to do why this much higher rate of death compared to any normal situations where their death rate is so low. Our death rate is unusually very high. So there we were failed to predict and prepare. And then that goes to the province number one also. We have a COVID hospital and the resurgence is the number of deaths. Uh, we already talk and then now we have 90% of people infected with second wave are See the how uh, how it is. Uh, Archana has shown nice, nice graph, but the case went like this, and the, automatically people were relaxed, and then the second wave surged up. This is the reason we should talk about. This is the political mass gatherings and rally and all these things happening throughout Nepal. So who is the responsible to educate our politician is the biggest challenge for this pandemic. Even today, whether the crux of the problem is understood by them or not, is a still a question. And we didn't have a proper way of risk communications, lack of evidence-based treatment guidelines. If you remember how these treatment guidelines is uh, in a different country, different protocol, and then uh, significantly, there are many COVID exports, but uh, when it comes to the reality in the hospital, uh, fortunately in the Eastern region of Nepal, we have a very good critical care medicine experts in three places, in three medical colleges and two zonal hospitals where most of the cases are getting treatment at the moment. But in the beginning, there was enough, not enough oxygen. So second wave is mostly uh, targeted because of the oxygen inefficiency, managing oxygen to the hospital. Now, uh, the, at the beginning of pandemic, if you look the holding sites and the quarantine centers in the country is every corner, every village development committee, they did it. Uh, the reason that they did is there, I am sure that there was a budget for it. So everybody was attracted to do some sorts of work in the uh, provincial level, in a local government level. And then what happened in the second wave, there was a no budget. So the whole concept of public health has been banished. Nobody is ready to start quarantine center. Nobody is ready to start with their isolation centers because there was everything was budget motivated. So we could not mobilize local governments and provincial government when the wave, second wave started. And that doesn't differentiate even today. The situation is same. Mostly cases reach to the hospital when it is a very difficult to manage in a at home or local health institution. So most of the cases at BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences or Virat Hospital or Koshi Zonal Hospital are referred cases, and that reaches in a very late stage, which is very difficult to manage. So this the gap it is still there. That may be the one reason where the hospital death every day we we face two or three days in the most of the hospital, which 
taken care. And then the what happened? Yeah, uh, most of the uh, I'll take a uh, maximum two minutes. So what uh, what is the migration issues? Many people do not know what is the porous border in India and Nepal means. Unless you stay in a border districts, even you dist stay in the hilly districts or mountain districts, you may not understand what it means. Even today, closed. The moment is not closed. The official border is closed. There is a porous another alternative side to commute in between the country. It's next to impossible to stop the border. And the, mostly this border issues, is I already discussed that five uh, states, Bihar, Sikkim, uh, Bengal, uh, Uttarakhand, and Uttar Pradesh. These five states is responsible and health and education is a, a state's matter in India. So even talking with Delhi, this is not, this is not going to sell. One of the photographs is provided by some of my friends, which was the uh, India-Nepal border situation. How in the quarantine you can hold people like this? So people didn't stay in the quarantine, they ran away. This was the reason. And when you have started in Khari Party from China, you have a high start treatment. When it comes to the workers level, you don't pay attention. So that was a big uh, difference between the people which you treat from coming from abroad. Now I just want to show you a little bit about VPKHS where uh, uh, we have uh, so some hospital which is uh, treating around 100 patients. Uh, now at the moment admitted in this hospital, we just turn a rehabilitation center to the COVID hospital over three months. And uh, for last one and a half year, this hospital is running smoothly. There was some issue in between, but that has been settled now. Uh, now, uh, vaccination program, we are we have started for healthcare workers with the country first time in the eastern region of Nepal, because they wanted to see the vaccine's effect at BPKSS and they took in other centers. Uh, uh, the, where we failed is uh, just I'm uh, putting the two, three point is very important. We have a very limited PCR, RT-PCR test kits, and still we are not doing enough investigations. Uh, failure of leadership, we, we can talk a lot, but which leadership? All levels, academic leadership, ministry, and the political leadership. All we have almost at the same way as to blame. And now I'll stop here and uh, we'll be happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Paras. That is very insightful. You know, some of the things that we were planning to discuss, you know, you also covered it. So the next phase is we're going to go to a thematic discussion uh, for the audience. If you have any questions, please put it on the chat. Um, Dr. Amir Sapkota will be moderating your questions in a little bit in the, in the third phase. So one of the major issues in, in public health you know, is disparity, disparity in screening and vaccination. Um, we all hear that catchy you know, phrase, nobody's safe unless everyone is safe but still there is disparity. Like Dr. Paras said, maybe hesitancy is not a problem in Nepal, but um, um, delivery and availability of you know, testing or vaccination is. So, um, but you know, in Nepal, you know, there is, you know, along with all the other factors, we have a caste system that is embedded in our you know, culture, in our uh, social structure that also brings another layer of disparity. So I will start with you, Dr. Archana, because you covered a little bit on disparity. Can you comment on disparity in screening and vaccination in Nepal um, as of today? And what might be good strategies that has been taken in Nepal or lack thereof? And what can be done going forward? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sabib. Uh, I, I think that in, even in my personal and professional life, I have never witnessed uh, disparity so closely and so in front of my eyes like how things are happening in Nepal and also in the worldwide especially in in terms of how we are responding to COVID not just a vaccine but also like COVID uh, treatment, COVID um, screening and uh, how we are reaching out to the population, how we are communicating the risk to the population even just the availability of the mask is, is a huge uh, issue of disparity over here but coming back to a vaccine, um, vaccine the access uh, is a big problem as we can see that 
uh, Bagmati province, and there is no brainer why it, it it is better access. There is a central and federal government over here, more urban areas, um, even the municipality level, the local community is much more empowered compared to other um, historically backward backwarded communities in other parts of the world. Uh, special, specifically in vaccine, uh, Right now, the biggest challenge is even to just get the register. So Nepal government has just announced that you need to register online to get the vaccine. So this strategy itself is expected to create a huge disparity because how what pe what percent of people in urban areas would be able to register themselves online uh, and what percent uh, in the rural, what percent of the educated people would be able to register themselves and what percent of uneducated, even like what percent of the people in like high uh, of high socioeconomic status who have access to internet and computer and other things uh, compared to those who don't have access. So even starting with uh, who willingness to uh, get the vaccine is, uh, is, is of a great concern here. And getting the vaccines, then of course the vaccination center are um, located in the feasible areas where more, uh, more uh, access, not, very, not accessible to everyone in this country. 70% of the people do not have like uh, access to any kind of health, uh, health center within 30 minutes of their distance, specifically in um, mountain areas, in, in hill areas. So even in, like even within, so there is a huge disparity. Like within within the country, we see disparity among uh, province. Within province, we see disparity among districts. Within district, we're seeing disparity among municipalities. Within municipality, there is a dis there is a disparity um, uh, among um, wards. Within wards, there is a disparity among like uh, concentrated areas and non concentrated like rural and urban areas. So, so. <sighs> Yeah, it's, it's been a big issue. So I think the, uh, just to touch upon like wh what could be a solution, I, I don't think there is a concrete solution to that and it should be a continuous discussion over it. But um, Nepal has been really, really good in the vaccination program, uh, uh, starting from micro planning of vaccination from each and every corner of our uh, country. We, we have run the vaccination program through primary healthcare outreach uh, clinics through our village health workers and reached every nook and corner of the country. So I think activating that network right now is the most important. And uh, uh, how we are prioritizing our citizens is also important. Um, also, there has been a lot, lot of anecdotals about getting the vaccines um, through payment to, um, from, from different sectors. It's, um, it's, it's been an ongoing rumor, like, but how the government or non-government sector or we at a, as a citizen really validate this information and act against it. And, and really like government, how can government Im improve the access? How can government bring a more uh, vaccine to the country? Right now we are relying on donations. So we, 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 we hear um, and then we see a lot of announcements about these many vaccines we has been do donated from these countries. And we are like going, uh, uh, going after a lot of um, uh, non-government organizations, other government bodies, but we are not talking about uh, purchasing vaccines ourselves. And uh, even that, I think, um, go and then if you look at the budget of Nepal, um, like millions uh, of dollars have been committed to build uh, oxygen plants in few centers, but why cannot we talk about purchasing the vaccine that's enough for our country. Okay, thank you, Dr. Archana. Dr. Paras, you touched a little bit on, um, you know, migrant workers and the borders. You know, can you comment a little bit more in terms of, you know, disparity and, and whatnot in that population or other population that you see? Dr. Paras, you are muted. Muted. Ah, okay. 
so what what uh, I'm, i was talking about one of the biggest challenges we have seen this pandemic is uh, migrant people in any developing country india nepal bangladesh sri lanka same what happened to the in country migration out country migration some of the migrant people working abroad coming home was a problem staying place was a problem and same happened in the border area when they came we are not able to screen quarantine isolate test treat them the reason was they are from poor strata of the society they are neither insured nor there is a possibility to take care of their food shelter so this is the biggest challenge we faced and the whole world faced in this pandemic so now how one can manage that there should be a mechanism to address this in a public health migration and health became an issue we have other problem like if you have noted our migrants migrants were only yesterday it is a big sad part in nepal the 24 or 25 people died in malaysia and 23 dead body came yesterday in nepal that was a huge issue i mean some of them whether it was a covid non covid that is already there but this covid aided this filled that problem and now i am staying in the eastern part of nepal we have border like kakadbitta biratnagar and nirmali which is in border uh, province number 2 and then the influx of the people not from only india or nepal there is even some of the people now you see from uh, bangladesh Uh, you cannot distinguish there are so many things is happening in this border areas who are working in that part of the country and uh, this how we can address this issue is a new thing new phenomena for migrant worker now testing antigen test would have been better for the migrant worker which we did not start in the beginning and there is another player in this if you look misery to few is a festival uh, misery to many festival for few this covid has proved again and again what happened the player came in is the, those uh, private sector they are not doing charity there are many hospital came up for the cost of uh, public health government is unable to produce uh, quality service in the hospital so they sold their life uh, whatever they have and they are getting treatment in the private hospital where the disease itself is a very unpredictable so the outcome may be good or may not be good in any hospital so these are the things which a migrant worker need to be addressed a different way that is what i say sandeep for now thank you very much thank you so we talking about equity equality disparity um dr mad of question for you is you know even among those who are vaccinated we are seeing these breakthrough cases and that has been a concern for the public can you you know describe you know breakthrough cases and vaccine effectiveness a little bit so the the public is a little bit clear sure thank you thank you for that question in fact that's one of my pet peeves even in the united states every day is on a news all oh, day you know so and so politician became you know had a breakthrough cases and my response to that is nobody said vaccines are 95% effect uh, 100% effective you know these these vaccines covid-19 vaccines do not provide what you call a sterilizing immunity that means if you get a vaccine then and if you get infected the vaccine may not be able to clear or keep the viral load to such a low level that a, they ne- they're not going to show up if you test or be you may you know you, you'll still be maybe able to you know transmit to somebody else but the you know, first thing is no vaccine uh, the covid vaccines are not 100% effective in terms of preventing the infection there's a difference between infection versus a disease but they are really 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 good 1995 and 98 all in terms of uh, of reducing the severity of the disease as well as the death and that's what we want so i i think rather than saying well they have breakthrough cases you, should, you know, the thing where to look at is oh they prevent 95% of the deaths or 98% of the deaths or or severe diseases 
So that takes over. And that, why is that important? It takes into the vaccine misconception. And what people say is, well, somebody got vaccinated and they got infected. And why should I get the vaccine? Well, that, yeah. so that, that, that's one thing. The other thing that these PCR tests are so sensitive, right? They're gonna pick up small amount of viral particles and they may be test positive, but you know that they may not actually have sufficient viral load to actually infect any, you know, somebody else. So those are the distinction that need to be made and publics need to be aware of those so it doesn't create false or misinformation regarding the, the efficacy of the, or effectiveness of the vaccines. Thank you, thank you very much for clarifying that. In the interest of time, we'll have one more question that will go around. So one of the thing is, you know, we have been focusing so much, this is everywhere, we have been focusing so much on COVID in the past, you know, 18 months to two years or so. But Nepal relies heavily on public health programs, whether they are run by the government, NGOs, INGOs, or institutes. I wanted to see, you know, how these, you know, programs have been impacted, given that so much, you know, focus has been given to COVID. I'll start with you, Dr. Paris. Yes, uh, uh, it touches everyone's life. You know, those who have, there, uh, those who heard about William Osler's aphorism that if you learn tuberculosis, you will learn medicine. Today, if you would have been, you would have said, if you learn COVID, you will learn the medicine. So this is the changes I've heard in 50 years time about medicine. It, it touches everybody's life. And what we were unable to do is the non-communicable disease became all of the sudden a challenge to managing COVID. Because if you look at the mortality, mostly it is caused by either hypertension, diabetes, and cancers, where there is the mostly cases has fatal outcomes. So at the same time, we closed everything. Hospital was not functioning well. And our public health workforce is not trained as such. If you look at uh, the colleague who are working in North America, you might be familiar that we do not practice public health. We practice population health. We do not have the genomic surveillance. If you ask our public health professionals working in the government system, many of them, they may not, be under, may not understand that. Nobody has uh, knowledge about molecular biology. So we, we didn't prepare the public, uh, public health workforce to work in that, which came all of a sudden a new challenge like COVID. Did would, did would have been anything like variant. Like if you, I gave example with the Indian college that Maharashtra has National Institute of Virology, you know, the premier institute in Pune. They produce the vaccine in Pune and they produce Delta also in Maharashtra. So this is the, this is the failure of public health. They could not detect early the, they could not do the genomic surveillance early to identify the delta and control within that uh, territory. So this is the challenge lies ahead uh, for us to change the uh, total orientation of public health towards more of a, um, infectious disease and that also to related to biomarkers. The first thing we have to change our public health workforce orientation. Second, what you said is uh, the, the challenge of COVID has neglected two areas. One is a maternal health, and the second is the non-communicable disease in this country. The, the, the mothers, again, the maternal death is increasing because the hesitancy to deliver in the hospital. And hospital became the hot spot to transmit the disease. The reason someone started, you know, for six months, Nobody accepted that it is airborne disease. Even WHO has totally confused and chaos. So the hospital design in our country is not like you see the, any procedural room in this in this country in a hospital is a center of uh, infections. Go to the ENT, go to the eye department. Most of the uh, uh, go to the microbiology lab. Uh, in our hospital now, who are mostly infected? It is the, the people working in the procedural room. There is a no. Uh, cross ventilation hospital is designed as such and the air condition is there. So these are the challenges we'll be going to face in the future, Sadiq. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll just, you touched a very important one on, you know, mother child, you know, maternal health. And Dr. Archana, you know, there is another, you know, pandemic 
um, that you know a lot of people in Nepal don't want to discuss about, and that is mental health. How has mental health uh, been affected by COVID-19? Sorry, your mic is not working. Um, am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so yeah, mental health has always, not just during the COVID, but it has always been a neglected issue in Nepal. Um, when we started COVID, when the COVID-19 um, started to hit Nepal, we started with a strict lockdown, even when there was no, uh, no COVID, no, not much COVID. And then we kind of, as a population, we faced a lot of fear, anxiety, and um, loneliness during that time. Uh, it was um, it was very, very strict at that time, especially in, uh, in the urban areas where people live, are used to living in a lot of crowd. So there has been uh, some publications from Nepal that has uh, also highlighted um, increased prevalence of COVID-19 affected, um, supposedly affected by the COVID-19 related isolation and lack of social um, interaction. Um, there, there were some like anecdotes reports about the increased rates of suicides uh, in Nepal during that time. Um, and uh, a lot of there was a lot of concern about the COVID-19 patients themselves and their uh, and their family members. There there had been a lot of fears and stigma and discrimination around that. Those who had been, especially in the villages, um, those who had who came to um, came from foreign countries and in this in our context, mostly from India, they were not allowed to enter in their village. Like they had to hide themselves even when they were in their house. And a lot of people were hiding their uh, COVID status as well. Even in our um, university, we faced that a lot of students were not allowed to come back to the university if when they were from Tarai region. I personally faced um, one issue where I had to go and counsel uh, one of the uh, house owners to let the student um, come back to the house because the classes were resuming. And um, I think that has had a lot of impact on not just uh, not just the COVID-19 patients who were facing the discrimination, but also their family members and even the uh, even the neighbors were uh, having a lot of fears. Um, uh, initially, when COVID was detected, um, uh, a lot of people used to go to the COVID-19 patient's house and they, there used to be like a big sign that, okay, this is the house of COVID-19 patient and people would also be afraid to even like cross that uh, specific path. Um, so mostly uh, first wave was driven like mental health. I think the mental health status were strained by this kind of stigma, discrimination, loneliness, fear, anxiety uh, imposed by the new disease. And I think the, it was, it was uh, also very much uh, contributed by, attributed by the lack of uh, knowledge about the disease. Even in our, even when we were designing the isolation center in, in our hospital, not, not lot, uh, uh, even clinicians were very afraid that it was an airborne disease. So there was a lot of confusion in the beginning as well. But as time passed, people became much more relaxed. And now it's, I think, um, uh, it's opposite. Uh, people are, they don't care about COVID much. They are like, uh, they are loosening up. They are like um, not taking care of uh, public uh, health measures like distancing, sanitizing, um, mask using, uh, use of mask, and even like proper use of mask is really poor. And uh, and people are getting uh, COVID. In our own, uh, one of our own research, uh, uh, we found that um, the people who had COVID-like symptoms had um, increased higher rates of depression, anxiety, and um, stress compared to those who did not, even within the COVID-19 patients who did not have a COVID, uh, we did not have symptoms. Okay, and, Dr. Uh, I think yeah. we have some questions. I, I didn't mean to cut you, but I think yeah, that this yeah. can be linked to the other questions that mm -hmm. some of the audience have. So I'm going to transition to Dr. Amir Sapkota. You know, before I transition, one of the things that Dr. Sapkota is an expert is in climate change. So I was wondering, Dr. Sapkota, if you could also 
say a few words about how climate change has impacted a pandemic like this, or if we've learned anything, and then go to the questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sresta. Um, I think it's uh, certainly a, a very impressive uh, panel here. And in the context of climate change, I guess at least there is no evidence thus far that directly links climate change to the ongoing COVID crisis. But what is important to realize is when we talk about climate change, we're often talking about the increases in frequency of extreme events like extreme heat, uh, extreme precipitation, ongoing heat waves. And then there's this notion of compound hazard, which applies to a situation where there are multiple hazards come into, uh, you know, interplay and interact. And the combined effect of those hazards are much worse uh, than if they were present in of themselves, right? So in the context of COVID-19, so, so we know the hospitals are overwhelmed right now treating this uh, COVID patient, right? So uh, when you have, for example, heat waves or, or, or you know, other diseases that are driven by climate change, so we don't have enough resources to, to focus on those. And, and you know, uh, so you have a lot of people dying of cardiovascular or the cardiopulmonary health outcomes because the resources are sucked up uh, by, uh, by COVID-19. And that particularly applies, uh, you know, gets magnified in, in a, a lower resources setting. Uh, but what I do want to, you know, before starting uh, with the audience's question, I do have one particular question that I want to pose to our distinguished panelists. And, and that is, this notion of uh, reactive versus proactive uh, approaches to pandemics, right? So thus far, we are just reacting to it, but this has shown that this approach is not enough, right? We need to be proactive. We need to be able to anticipate these hazards and prepare for it. So we don't have this kind of calamity in, in, in our hand. So in that context, I want to pose question particularly to uh, uh, Dr. Paras and Dr. Arsena. Uh, what do you see, you know, at, you know, how can Nepal move forward in the context of preparedness? Um, you know, both, I'm talking about both, both the medical institution, the uh, public health institution, the economic institution, as well as the political institution. What are the lessons that can be applied in, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, changing things so we can, as, as a country, as a society, can be better prepared for next pandemic that may be in the horizon five years from now or 20 years from now, whatever that may be? Dr. Arsena or Dr. Paras, whoever want to uh, take a stab on that first. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Paras. Host unmuted you, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Amir. I think this is uh, the million dollar questions, not to Nepali diaspora, but to all of us how we can be proactive to the planetary health and that to the next pandemic or any of these sorts of... Uh, recently, if you remember that uh, Sindhu Palsok landslide was an example that uh, if that happens and the, within the pandemic, how we will be able to manage that type of episodes. Uh, one of the... Uh, advantage which we are on the process is we have local governance and provincial governance in anatomy if it translates in functions if it translates in physiology i'm sure that will be a big strength because the local governance has to be prepared to the challenges and uh, we have 708 local governance in the country and that local governance has to be equipped with the human resources, infrastructures, and knowledge and skills. That is one. The second is the, what the public health workforce, practitioner, public health practitioners, and public health academia can do together. Is we have to find a way that the people can perceive us that we are not fortune tellers, you know. 
the COVID may make most of the public health professional as a fortune teller. They say something today, and if you find in Nepal in the morning in radio, every public health professional talks in a different language, different aspects and different predictions. That infodemic is not created by layman. That is created by educated lot. That has to be changed. Country like ours. The Thank third you. important part. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, Arsena, uh, do you have a few words to add to that? Sure, sure. I just, I would just want to add, uh, I agree with Dr. Paris, and in addition to that, I think um, our nation really has to prepare on um, on really how we can identify that it's coming. So we are really lacking in how we manage our data, how we are collected, our, how we're collecting the data on this. So a lot of things, why we are being so reactive at in this situation is a lot has to do because we uh, do not get the proper right kind of information at the right time. And we are we, we are reacting after we uh, we see a huge wave coming to us and we, we don't see the like, uh, the small wave that's getting uh, that's getting larger. So, uh, one of one of the things that would be really be is to establish a, a comprehensive surveillance uh, C system that's data driven. Uh, I think the, another thing that I would like to highlight on and add on to Dr. Paris uh, would be the denial that uh, we as a, um, a professional or as a, like leaders, uh, the kind of denial that I have seen is uh, pretty high and that has to be uh, crossovered with, uh, prop, uh, with the right kind of dialoguing. So I think we also need to open up a platform in our country, uh, in the ministries and in local governance to uh, facilitate that kind of dialogues between those who are making the decisions and those who have the right information. And, um, and then how, how we can like strategize to work together um, to prepare. All right, thank you very much. And I, I think this whole uh, the notion of conflicting information coming, uh, it, it's, 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 you know, very, uh, you know, it, it's very challenging. And, and that reflects the evolving nature of the virus and the science itself that uh, uh, Sadibzi alluded to earlier. Um, so getting to the questions from the audience, um, I think the first question from Professor Brijes Tapa uh, is similar to the one raised by Biswas Koirala. Uh, and we, which has to do, you know, uh, which deals with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, vaccine, right? So some people have received vaccine months ago and, and haven't received first dose months ago and they have not managed to get the second dose. Um, and and uh, other, in other instances, you know, those people who got the vaccine a while ago are now thinking about getting a different doses, uh, you know, made by different manufacturer. So there's this, you know, uh, you know, confusion about what happens if you are to mix and match uh, those uh, you know vaccines made by different manufacturers so um, I was wondering if uh, you know you could uh, comment some uh, uh, something about that uh, this 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 applies to all three panelists I guess so um, I see Madhavzi has started to take a stab on it uh, so do you want to start Madhav? Sure thank you thank you for that question yes um, the the dose dosing interval there are two issues that are raised one is why aren't people getting you know, two doses when they are recommended and that's a logistic questions are more of a management question from a biological perspective i think what we know is if the the interval is increased let's say you need to take a dose within three weeks but you didn't get access you got five or six weeks later I think that's still be effective and helpful in from, from a biological, immunological perspective. The, the second question is why didn't the people who got the first dose didn't get the second dose? That's a, a management issue uh, that probably maybe the people on the ground can, uh, can answer that question better. And the other is mixing different, different types of vaccine. As of right now, you know, they're not recommended. And especially, I think in my presentation, I alluded, you know, not all vaccines are the same. The technology we have right now, three types of vaccines that are approved, the mRNA vaccines, they are, uh, the viral vector vac vaccines and the whole cell vaccines. In Nepal, I, the Johnson Johnson is a viral vector vaccine and similar to AstraZeneca. And, and then the Chinese vaccine, Vetocel, is a whole cell vaccine. So, you certainly don't want to mix the you know, different types of vaccines and even made by different same 
different companies right now is not uh, indicated. Um, anything to add to that, uh, Parasudin? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that is a logistic issue, and uh, Covishield is a question may be intended to the Covishield, which is one million people are waiting for a second dose because it was almost ready to, uh, almost paid for the um, buying with India, but because of the insurgents in India, they could not export. But the as uh, um, uh, Amir and Sadi praise that it is a evolving science and every day we are learning that Covishield has a much better performance if you have wider gap. So I'm sure within uh, two weeks we will have a vaccine of 1.6 million and those people who have already taken 1 million vaccine will be get, going to get second jab. So I'm sure that problem will be solved. That is uh, one thing and the second thing is that very not a very good uh, report from Israel that even the mRNA vaccines is waning off for the older populations and so the booster dose is needed and so the Israeli study shows that uh, even the vaccine is not permanently having solution unless there will be booster dose or something else. So we have to go through the evolving science and collect the best evidences. Now the uh, Covishield's first dose was also partially protective, but the second dose, once there will be, even they say the Delta, uh, also severity of Deltas will be less. So I hope that with the 1.6 million doses reaching within a week or 10 days in Nepal, that problem will be solved. But it is a logistic problem. Thank you. And one last question that we have, uh, I think there are several other questions that we're not going to have time to uh, get through it. But one question is, uh, raised by uh, Swatantra Gautam and his uh, wondering uh, this, uh, the implication of waiting in line to get vac COVID vaccine from 2 a.m. in the morning. What are the danger of getting infected just by virtue of standing on that crowded line? Could you comment on that, uh, Archana? Of course, uh, that has been a lot, there has been a lot of concern about that. Uh, and. Uh, there, there is not there is not much uh, research evidence, but uh, we do know that the crowding increases the risk of COVID um, transmission of COVID nineteen. So yeah, that that certainly is a possibility, and it's not just the line. Um, so a lot of uh, centers are. Uh, giving away the tokens and uh, when you collect the tokens people are not even standing in the line they are like really crowded desperate to get the tokens when it is started to distribute so actually in the in practice um, it's um, they they they, ha they are in line until the token is announced and once the token is announced then everybody is in the same room like, trying to get it and there definitely is uh, is uh, is a lot of risk uh, around right. that. So to address that, government is trying to prepare a list of um, pre-prepare a list of people who are willing to take the vaccine, register them online, and that has its own implications in terms of disparity as well. Thank you. Um, I think that was a, a great. Uh conclusion to our discussion. So I want to take the last couple of minutes uh, to wrap uh, and, and recap what uh, you know we learned. Uh, uh, but first and foremost, uh, I do want to take this opportunity to, to acknowledge NACA for bringing us, uh, all of us together. This was a fantastic uh, uh, seminar, should I say. Uh, and please remember, NACA is a completely run by volunteers. Uh, so it uh, requires a lot of effort on these volunteers and there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. So I wanna extend my heartfelt gratitude to the, the, the uh, executive uh, members of NACA, uh, including Milanji and Ganzi and, um, and, and all, uh, all others who have uh, uh, made this uh, possible. Um, so just to recap, um, I wanna start with uh, Sadibzi's comment earlier that this pandemic is obviously global and it does not recognize 
um, you know, any national boundary uh, that are created by humans, right? So collective effort on this obviously makes a huge difference. And the other is that the virus is constantly evolving and so is our understanding of the virus itself. Um, and, and this is, I, I think, reflective of the science. Science is not static, right? It's constantly uh, evolving. But the challenge in this case is the evolution is happening so fast. It's literally happening in uh, lightning speed, um, right? And the, the each new, uh, you know, things that we learn that has an implication on our real life that unfold on a uh, real time, whether that be our freedom of movement, whether to ma wear masks or not to wear masks, you know, development of vaccine and, and uh, obviously the treatment of, of patients in the hospital, right? So that is what is so different in this round is, is these changes are happening so fast. And because of that, there are a lot of uncertainties, right? And we as a scientific community, I felt as though have not done uh, uh, as good of a job in terms of uh, conveying that uncertainty and conveying that evolving nature of science. But I do want to uh, I, I, I do want to bring your attention to one last point, and that is, uh, like Madhavji said earlier, the uh, infection fatality rate in this case is 0.7 percent. In that, you know, if you get infected, point, you know, you, have, you know, 0.7 percent of the population die. But I want to bring your attention to another virus, which is the Ebola virus that was first discovered in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo back in 1976, which was, used to be called Zaire back then. That Ebola virus, depending upon the strain, has a case fatality rate ranging from 25% to 90%, right? Anywhere from 25% to 95% of people who uh, contact Ebola end up dying. Uh, the average is 50%. So, you know, think about the next pandemic, you know, if the viral next viral pandemic has the case fatality rate that resembles the Ebola virus, but has infectivity that's similar to COVID. COVID is highly efficient in terms of transmission, right? So if we have that, you are talking about, you know, instead of having 193 million people infected and uh, out of that 4 million death, you, uh, you will end up uh, anywhere, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people did just by, you know, uh, just using the number of people that have been infected so far, right? So I know this sounds like a, you know, hypothetical scenario, but none of us thought about, you know, a pandemic like this could be possible even two years ago. And the fact that each of these different strains of virus are here, you know, with the, uh, co you know, COVID highly infective in Ebola, highly, you know, uh, you know, very high uh, fatality rate. Who's to say that the next pandemic is not going to have a, a, a combination of those characteristics? And those are the things I think of people in public health, you know, we worry about and that same thing goes for an, on the medical field too. So that's where I was getting to when I asked my earlier question about preparedness for the next, um, you know, uh, epidemic on the horizon. So this was a fantastic, uh, you know, seminar overall. I learned a lot, and uh, I want to thank again, extend my heartfelt gratitude to NACA for organizing that. And I know we are running a couple of minutes over uh, time in this, so I want to, uh, you know, ask uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Sadiq Sresta, as well as uh, NACA host, uh, for the last comment if they have. I have none. Um, thank you all for joining. Hopefully, I learned as much as, um, and you all learned as much as I did. Um, back to Naka, Dr. Gyan. Gyanji or Milanji, if you have any last parting words. 